texted me sometime last night and I uh, wanted to know if I could fill in. I said, well, I got a message for the teenagers, so I'll order it down a little bit and give it to the adults. <laughs> and uh, no, I'm not going to order anything down because God's Word says not to order down the Word. Amen. But I do have a, a short message. I believe my mic's cutting in and out. I think the battery's about to go dead. I could put this earpiece in, but uh, I have never used it. I really don't like it. I'd rather give me another mic or something. Word to 
anybody else and share it with them so that it means anything, so that it can be shared from one person to another. You see, Jeannie can come up here and play this piano. She can put the notes together in the form of a song, and it, just like she did tonight, and you can sing to it, and you can make melody with it, and it will get, it'll go into your heart. And you can be going to work the next day, or you can be going home, and that melody will be in your heart. And you'll be, the first thing you know, you will be humming or, or singing that same song that was played last night or yesterday or last week because it made sense. And it, it was stuck inside of your heart or stuck inside of your mind. And it's the same thing with the Word. When, it's, when you work at it, you put it together, and it comes to you with power. Then it sticks with you. It stays with you. And you can take it because it comes out of your heart and you can share it with somebody. You can share it with somebody else. And then they take it and it sticks inside of them because it makes sense to them. And then they can take it and share it with somebody else. And that's when it comes out with power. And you have the authority to be able to do that. And I'm going to read just a minute. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, when Jesus spoke to the disciples, this is simple scripture. You've all heard it before, but it's something I'm going to run over to you again. This is something I'm going to share with the teenagers tonight. Since I had the opportunity to share it here, I'm going to share it with you. This is what we're going to go over in the back now. It said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, he was talking to the disciples. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manners of sickness and all manner of disease. And in verse 8, he skipped down to verse 8, he said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Amen. And then in the bottom of that verse, he said, freely you have received and freely give. That's where he gave them the authority to do that, what he had told them to do. He gave them, he told them what to do, he gave them instruction, and he gave them the authority to do it. Now, they could have sat back on their, in their seats and, and never gone out and spoken to anybody. But they took the word that came out of Jesus' mouth, which was the spoken word of Jesus Christ himself. And they took the authority that he gave them. And they went about the country and they healed people. They healed the lepers, they healed the sick. They raised people from the dead. They cast out devils. They did all this stuff. And they had the authority to do it. And that same power that Jesus spoke to them has been spoken to the church. And we have that same power. We have that same authority in the name of Jesus Christ. By the spoken word of Jesus Christ. We have the same authority. We have the same power. <clears throat> Jesus gave his disciples the power and authority to use, to use that power. And he commanded them to go out and do it. He sent them. He sent them. And we're all disciples, each and every one of us. Every one of us is living, breathing Christians, born again Christians here in this church are disciples of Jesus Christ. Every one of us. And we're commanded by the word to go out into the mission field, and that's right outside those doors, and to, to everywhere you go. And in some shape, form, and fashion, by the spoken word, and at the very least by the actions of yourself, be a disciple and be a witness to somebody every day of your life. Everybody in the grocery store, the workplace, every time you're walking up and down the street, you're expected by Jesus Christ himself to be an example. And you are. You really are. You are the light of the world. Jesus, the spirit of Jesus Christ, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive inside of you. And you are the light of the world because he's the light of the world. Praise God. Jesus said that he was sick. He didn't say just go up and pray for somebody and hope you have to get better. He said he was sick. He didn't say go beg him. He didn't say ask him to heal the sick. Did he say go ask me to heal the sick? He said you go heal the sick. He said you do it. You've got the power and the authority to do it. So that's what he said. That was his command. There's a big difference. And a large segment, is a, that's a big difference in begging God to heal the sick and you going out with the power and authority that you've already got inside of you to go out and heal, touch them and heal. Don't go, you're not beggars. We're not beggars. 
We're children of God. We don't have to beg. We're not beg. We already have everything we need to do the work of God. Um, a lot of second Christians don't even believe that God heals today anyway. A lot of them don't, people don't even believe that God's in the healing business. They don't, have, they don't believe it. They don't have enough faith to even believe it. Because they've never seen anything happen when they pray. They just go and pray but never see any results. They never see anything happen. So they don't believe it. Um, even among those who do believe in the miraculous power of God, most of them uh, follow, uh, aren't following the model that Jesus put forth with his disciples. Instead, they're starting from the perspective, the position of powerlessness. They're, they're starting from a position of being a wimp to begin with, and they're saying things like, Lord, well, we know we're nothing. We know we're at the bottom of the totem pole. We know we're just a speck. And uh, we know we don't mean nothing. That's not, that's not true. I just told you, you had power and authority. I just told you, you're a child of the king. That's right. I heard a song the other day that said, we're, we're, we're princes and princesses in the kingdom of God already. You don't have to wait and die and go to heaven to be, be a prince or a princess in God's kingdom. You're already. You already have authority. You already are in the royal kingdom right here where we're at now. And, uh, he said, we can't do anything. We're just waiting on you, Lord. Stretch out your hand and heal and, and move in, in our lives. We're waiting on you. Well, you're going to sit there and wait right on. You're going to keep right on waiting. You'll be waiting until Jesus comes back. You'll still be waiting. <clears throat> Begging and pleading God to, to release his power is contrary to the command of God. We're not beggars. We already have what we need. Jesus gave us the power over sickness and disease and demons. He said, now you heal the sick. You cast out demons. You cleanse the lepers. You raise the dead. He didn't tell us to pray and ask him to do it for us. That's right. He didn't, he didn't tell us to ask him. He said, you go do it. Here you go do it. It's like you, have, you raise children and they get to a certain age. They get big enough to do things on their own. They don't keep coming to you and ask you to tie their shoes for them when they're 16 years old. Did, they, did, your, did your 16 year olds come to you and say, Mama, tie my shoes? Daddy, how about tie my shoes for me before I go to school? No, he said, Younger, you're big enough to tie your own shoes. You're big enough to put your own belt on. And that's what he expects us to do. We're, oh, we're big enough, we're mature enough, and we've been given the power and authority to do it for ourselves. So, Jesus gave us the authority. <clears throat> he told us to go out and do these things. Now I want to put a little balance in it. And the balance is we aren't doing it in our own power. That's right. Because it's God's power working the mirror. But we're responsible for taking the action. Just like I came over here, I'm going to do it again. I want to drive it home now. This piano has the power to play melodies, to play beautiful music. Music that will move you. Music that will touch your heart. Music that, this piano has the power to play music that will, will just light you up and just make you feel wonderful. And, and that music that you can receive in your heart and go out and, and, and remember and hum and, and go out and share with somebody. And that's a sound that can be heard all over this building. One little note. But it won't do a thing until somebody comes up here and takes action and plays it. Somebody that's taking time to study. Somebody that's taking time to work and read and study and know how to put the notes together. Somebody that's taking time to read and study and put the words together and be able to, and work at it. Somebody that's taking time to do what the Word of God says do. Praise God. It won't come to you just by saying it. Um, um, don't work that way. You got to open the book. You got to open the page. You got to put your eyes on it. <laughs> it won't come by putting it under your pillow and sleeping on it. It don't work, it don't work that way. Praise God. For, uh, I want to look at John chapter 15 verse 5. It says, and this is where I want to put the balance in it also. Because, again, I said that, you know, we're not doing it on our own. God is a power. 
working miracles, but we're responsible for the action. John 5, 15 and 5, it says, I am the vine. That's right. And ye are the branches. Yes. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Much fruit. There's no fruit that comes off the branch of the vine. It comes off the branches. The fruit is produced off the branches. It doesn't come off the vine. It comes off the branches. But the branches are attached to the vine. And that's where the nourishment comes from. Through the branches, off the vine, out of the vine, through the branches to the fruit. The fruit's produced on the tips of the branches. Praise God. For without ye, me, ye can do nothing. Without me, that's God. That's ye can do nothing. That's and that's true. That's what the word says. Without Jesus, you're a zero. On my own, I can't heal a man. But I'm never on my own. That's never. right. Never That's have right. I been alone. Never have I been on my own. Sometimes maybe I felt like I was alone. But I've never been on my own. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. After you were born again, God places his power on the inside of you. Over sickness, disease, and death. <laughs> the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Is now dwelling in us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll read 19 and 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places? That same power. Raise Jesus from the dead is the power that's living inside of you. The very same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Praise God. Whenever you approach God and say if you're powerless to change your situation, you don't understand the power he's given you. You might be asking for the right thing or seeing the right results, but you're going about it the wrong way. The scripture says James chapter 4 verse 7, Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. God tells us to resist the devil. Resist means to actively fight against. Resist. It's our responsibility to resist the devil. You don't go to God and ask him to get the devil off your back. You have to resist him. God says for you to resist the devil. God is already defeated. He's already under his feet. He's already under your feet. God's already done his part. He's already done it. He defeated him at the cross. That's right. Already done it. It's a done deal. He's asking you to do your part now. He's telling you to resist it. Look, if you think the devil's in your house, if you think he's attacking you, what he wants you to do is go to the front door, open the door, and tell him to get out. Amen. You've got that authority to tell him to get out. And I've done that. Now, I don't know if you have or not, but I have. And you have the authority to tell him. If you, if you feel like there's an oppressive spirit in your house attacking you or on your back attacking you, it says resist it and he will flee from you. And I believe that. And you just go to the door and open the door and you go in there and you command that thing to get out of your house. Get off of your family. Get out of your family. Get out of your finances. Get out of whatever is piddling in and meddling in your life. And tell him, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to get out yes. and leave this household alone. Amen. And I guarantee you, if you believe in faith, he will leave you alone. He will get out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But you can't leave no cracks when you get back in. Oh, yeah. Right. You got to believe. You got to truly believe. Go to the front door and kick him out. You have to actively fight against him yourself. Praise God. John 10 and 10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and destroy. He said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have more blood. That's the exact polar opposites. What the devil's come for and what Jesus has come for. God tells us to resist the devil. If we don't, <clears throat> he will not go away. If you don't resist him, he's going to stay right there and be closest. 
pal. And he won't be a friend that sticks closer than a brother, but he'll be your pal as long as you keep him around. Right. Right. He'll stay right there. That's right. All right? I can plead with you, plead with God until uh, I'm blue in the face. And I can give him all the ins and outs of how desperate my situation is. But nothing's going to happen until I resist the devil myself. He expects you to do it. Again, just like I told you, you have to deal with it just like you do your own children. He deals with you just like you're his children. Uh, you expect them to have certain responsibilities of their own. If they've got a dirty room, you, you need to expect them to clean up their own mess. If they've made a mess, you need to expect them to have the responsibility to clean it up. Right, Sierra? <laughs> I see you hide the face back there. Clean up your own room. That's your responsibility. Yep. And that's the way you resist it. Praise God. Be a victor instead of a victim. You have to take responsibility. God gives you the power to change your situation. Quit being a victim and resist the devil. Get a victory. Praise God. Psalms 89 34. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Now, he's told you these things in the Word, and he can't go against his own Word. That's right. He can't back down from that. Oh, he'd love to help you. He'd love to, and he will put his arm around you and comfort you. He'll love you. He'll love you all the way, but he can't go against his Word. What he's told you to do, that your part is, he can't go against that. He's, you've got to do your part. That's the only way you can deal with it. Because he cannot go against what he said in his Word. Bible says that when something comes out of the mouth of God, it's covenant. So when God says something, it's binding to Him. Words sometimes don't mean much to people, but God never violates His own word. Never. Now, it isn't an opinion for God to tell us to do something and then go back on His word and, it, and do it for us. Uh, Hebrews 1 and 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. This is very important. When he had his, by himself, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, what all this means, I'm going to read that again. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding, this is the important part, and upholding, or the most important part, upholding all things by the word of his power. He's upholding all things yeah. by the word of his power. Yeah. God's word holds, is the glue that holds everything together. His word. That holds everything together. Jesus was a perfect, identical representation of the Father. Perfect, identical representation of the Father. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. The universe is held together by the power of Jesus' word. And if Jesus ever violated the integrity of his word, then the things of the world would cease being held together. The world and the universe would be destroyed. If he went back on his word and didn't abide by his word, then everything would fall apart. One time. If he went back on his word one time, then everything from the very beginning, we fall apart because everything stands on the Word of God. Everything. Everything. So he will not go back on the Word. Praise God. He spoke it. He spoke it into existence. That's right. So if he went back on his Word, everything would be out of existence. Back to the beginning. Praise God. All right. I want to go to one more thing here. Just one more item. A parable. And it's again about the Word of God. One day Jesus saw in from a distance a fig tree. And y'all know this parable about the fig tree. And I'm going to go over it and make a point on it. One day Jesus saw from a distance a fig tree with leaves. Now think about a fig tree when it's growing leaves. You know, most trees in the spring, they bud out and they start growing leaves. Then after the leaves mature and the, the, they, 
they bloom and they start growing fruit. The leaves mature first and then the fruit matures. And then once it, the, there's a season through the summer, the fruit gradually matures. And then when it starts fall, the fruit is mature and it ripens and it's ready to eat. Now a fig tree is different. When the, when the leaves start growing, the figs come on the tree too. And the whole time the leaves are maturing, the figs are maturing at the same time. So when a fig tree starts growing leaves, it starts growing figs at the same time. And you'll have it all matures together. So Jesus saw this fig tree and he saw it had leaves on it. So he was hungry. So he went to the fig tree to get him something to eat. Well, when he got to the tree, there weren't no figs on it. So he was a little disappointed, and I believe that he knew there weren't no figs on it because he's Jesus. But he walked the earth as a man, so I'm, I can't speculate that. But anyway, he went to the fig tree with leaves, waiting, wanting to find food. Well, the fig tree didn't have any figs on the tree, and so he cursed the tree. He spoke to it. He spoke to the tree because it didn't have any figs. It was supposed to have figs. It's kind of like a half-hearted church member uh, that's supposed to be producing fruit. It looks like it was producing fruit. It had all the greenery on it and all the decoration, but it wasn't producing any fruit. But the point here is Jesus spoke to that fig tree. And uh, by cursing the fig tree, the fig tree dried up. See, it dried up from the root. It died. From the root of it, every part of that fig tree died. But it didn't die instantly. Even though Jesus himself spoke to it, it died overnight. It was the next day before they, the disciples saw that the fig tree had dried up. And what I'm saying to you here is, even though you speak the word, even though you may pray to something, about something, speak a healing on somebody, you may not see it instantaneously. All miracles don't happen in an instant. Some of them take time. Some of them may take a day. Some of them may take a year. Some of them may take months, but they happen. And what I'm saying here is, see, Jesus spoke to this fig tree, and it, like I say, it dried up from the root. And there's other ways you can go with the fig tree. But what I, the point I'm making is you don't always see results the instant that you pray. So don't give up. The word goes forth with power whether you see any results or not. That's right. That's my point. Once you speak the word, once you speak the name of Christ, once you speak it out, it goes out with power whether you see it or not. You still believe. You still have faith. You believe that it goes out with power. It's like if I play a note or Jeannie comes up and plays a song on that piano. That song goes out. And you, she may not see a single one of you praising or seeing a result from that song going out. But that song is still going in your ears. And it's going into your heart. And you're receiving it. And like I say, you'll be walking down the aisle or you'll be walking out the door and you may be humming that song in your heart. And you may be humming that song the next day because it ministered to you. And that's the way the word is. That's the way the word goes out. It goes out with power and the word says that it will not come back void. That's right. So speak. Speak. Because it's the word of God. Don't hesitate to speak the word. Don't be shy. Be bold. Because you have the power and authority. And that's a uh, point that I wanted to make. And I'm going to make one more thing and then I'll be through. I'm going to finish up about the word, about the power of Jesus' name. Praise God. About the fig tree. The very instant that Jesus spoke to that fig tree, it died. But it didn't show the results until the next day. It was a done deal when the word went out. So when you speak with power and authority, the word of God, it's a done deal when you speak it. But you may not see the results until the next day or the next day or the next day. 
So don't lose faith. Don't lose heart. Because that word will not come back for you. And one other thing I want to mention. You've all, what have you heard, some of the things you've heard lately in the news? Have you heard anything about ISIS lately? What do you get? Have you heard, I'm saying ISIS, ISIS. Yep. You've been hearing about the turmoil in the Middle East and the tragedies of the people being killed and murdered. And they're taking children into slavery. I've heard they're, they're taking children as young as three years old and selling them into as sex slaves. Yeah, they are. Especially little girls. <clears throat> That's one of your tar favorite targets. <clears throat> Islamic State of Jihad that your president refuses to acknowledge. It's a terrible state. It's a terrible situation. But it's a sign of the end time. Jesus is coming back soon, folks. Yeah. Amen. And I, I pray that we're all prepared. Yeah. Uh, and not all Muslims are that bad, but they're all led astray. And, and we need to be praying for all of them. Uh, and the point, a point that I want to make here, I just want to get just a few things. In the time of the prophet Muhammad, he went all through the Middle East trying to destroy the work of Jesus. The churches that were built and established by Paul and the disciples, he went around behind them and tried to destroy them, killing the church, destroying the churches and killing them and destroying all the parts of the church and trying to destroy the Christians. That was one of his missions, one of his goals, to kill them all, destroy them. <clears throat> and now ISIS, that's their same goal now. Go throughout the Middle East and destroy the Middle East, destroy the Christians, Christianity. That's one of their goals, destroy all the churches. And their ultimate goal is to destroy Christianity throughout the world, including the United States. That's why they're so public. They have a lot of money. They're into uh, drug dealing. They're into slavery. They're into uh, all kinds of most horrendous, terrible things you can think of. And you'll see it on. You'll see some of it on TV, but a lot of it you won't. Uh, your mainstream media that most folks watch, you will not see some of it because they won't air it. They, they won't show it because they don't want you to know how bad it is. If you go to some of you uh, Christian TV, some of you Fox News, you will see a lot more of it. I go on the computer and look at a lot of it on the, the uh, Christian TV that is trying to get the word out. And, uh, but anyway, they're trying to destroy the Christian nation, trying to destroy Israel. Uh, they are full of hate and darkness, death, brutality. But we have the answer because Jesus Christ is still in control. God is still in control. That's right. He's not lost control. That's right. The world still has the. We're, we're still the light of the world, and, and they're deathly afraid. The reason they won't destroy Christians and Christianity is because they're deathly afraid of us. They're terribly afraid of Christianity. Yeah. Because they know that Christianity is the answer. Yeah. But they've been blinded by Satan. The, the Muslim world, these, these extreme jihadists, they've been blinded by Satan. And that's their problem. They, they're blinded. And we need to be praying for them. And that's what God asks us to do, pray for our enemies. And, um, you know, they, they showed, you may have seen on the TV where they captured these 30 Egyptian Christians. I believe they were Egyptian. The 30 that they captured and they cut their heads off. Were they Egyptians, Pastor? I believe they were. I will I know they were. But they were Christians. 30 of them. And they cut their heads off. Christian men. And they videoed. And I'm sure most of you.
probably yeah. haven't seen that video, but it's it's on. You can pull it up on the computer and actually see them cut their heads off. And it's a horrendous thing. <clears throat> but what they didn't do is they didn't cut out the sound when they did this. And when they marched them in by the sea, they made a point that I noticed that all the jihadists, all the ISIS guys were big men. They were all very much taller than the Christian men. And they, they made it that way because they wanted them to look big and bad and, you know, more powerful than the Christians. They were all tall, big tall men. And the Christians were short men. They weren't real short men, but they were average sized men. But they made sure all the ISIS men were big, tall, great big tall men, all wrapped in black from head to toe. <clears throat> and then having hands behind their back, they kneeled them down by the sea. But what they didn't do is cut out the audio. And just before, when they kneeled them down, just before they were slaughtered, them, every one of these men were praising Jesus, saying, Amen. thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, Amen. in Arabic. They were saying it in Arabic. Every one of them. They gave them the opportunity, said, we'll not do this if you convert to Islam. And they said, no, we love our Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of them died a martyr. And I guarantee you that one day, these men will come back to Christ, riding a white horse. And these men that killed them, if they're still alive, and they will see them anyway, they'll see them coming back to Christ. Because they'll be the martyrs that will come back. Christ and they'll be seen in victory but I'm telling you these men they every one were saying we love you Lord we love you our Lord Jesus Christ every one of them. and that my friends is the power of the word Amen. And that word has been heard that word has been heard with power and authority that word has gone out and there has millions of people all over the world has heard that. <clears throat> now these guys think that they have won a victory. But the Christians won the victory. Amen. Because they got their last words. Yes. They got the word of victory. They had the power of the name of Jesus Christ on their lips. And it went out before they died. And that's the point I wanted to make at the end of this message. Amen. And I wanted you to hear that. It's... it's, it's I didn't want to end on a sad note. I wanted to end on a victorious note. Because they ended on a victory, folks. Right. They died martyrs, but they died in victory, not in, not in defeat. Not in defeat. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let us stand on our feet. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. But I just want you to understand the power. The power that goes out in everything that you do. Lord Jesus Christ. Every word that you speak, every step that you take, every action that you take goes out of power. Whether you see it or not, believe it. Because it will not come back over. It's a powerful thing. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for everyone that's here tonight. I thank you for their love. I thank you for their kindness. I thank you for your mercies. And Lord, bless each and every one, Lord God. Let this word not come back over, Lord. Let it be used. Let someone share it with someone else, Lord. Tell them about the power of the name of Christ. Let them tell them about the power of the word, Lord. And that they have to somehow, Lord, step forth. There has to be an action taken on their part for this power to go forth, Lord. You give them the, you give them the authority and you give them the power. But somebody has to take a step, Lord. Somebody has to take a step. Somebody has to speak a word. Somebody has to put it together, Lord God, because you have commanded them to do so. I love you, Lord. I thank you for this night. Bless them all, Lord, out this week, Lord, in their work, in their school, in their everyday life, whatever they may do. Lord. Bless them in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Praise God.